This particular lecture is part of another lecture for my class. I cover the 2008 Great Recession in rather large detail for my class. But in that other lecture, I wanted to make it shorter for YouTube people. So I pulled this particular 18 minute lecture on the recession out. So if you need to hear about the recession, if it's part of what your instructor expects you to know, this is a great review of sort of what led up to the recession. If you don't need to know it, then basically you can skip this lecture. But in the meanwhile, let's get to talking about the 2008 Great Recession and what led up to it. Pretty much all economists at this point agree that the Great Recession of 2008 is really triggered by high level levels of leverage and debt. So let's take kind of a look at this. If we're looking at the debt, domestic outstanding debt versus GDP for that time period, we show that we have this really high rate of debt that begins to occur just before 2008. Now this is the percentage of debt versus GDP. So it, pay, it peaks around 370% of GDP. Now, even in 2018, when this chart ends, you can see the debt level is still pretty high. But we might want to look at, you know, is it the financial sector or the non-financial sector that has this really high debt? And one of the interesting things about this chart is that you see that it's pretty straight for the non-financial sector. It does go up here between the 2000 recession and the 2008 recession, and then it stays pretty much the same level. But what's interesting is the financial sector, which goes up constantly in this straight line up. Now, after the 2008 recession, there are many regulatory things that are put in and they deleverage and you can see they're coming down. But notice the domestic non-financial sector, it didn't do that. We may also want to look at things such as a business versus government versus household. And probably one of the things you see right away is that household debt went up tremendously. And we're going to find that this household debt is going to be buying houses. You can also see that business debt went up tremendously. And again, there's specific reasons for that. Now, the government debt's kind of interesting because you see this huge debt that comes up here. Well, this is trying to pull out of the financial crisis. And so money was spent to try to stimulate the economy. But we'll see sort of like a timeline here. Or let's talk about the timeline of what occurs. This actually starts back in like 1980. In the 1980s, we had something called the savings and loan crisis. Now, this was caused by a lift of certain restrictions that were out there. Basically, regional banks, um, you know, they held mortgages. They literally held the mortgage for 30 years. But when the restrictions were lifted, people wanted more from these banks than they could give. And so what happens is, is that it changes how mortgages are basically given and collected because the regional banks really can't make a living anymore by holding these mortgages because interest that people wanted on their, their money was much higher than what the mortgage rates were. And Remember, a bank makes its money because it gives you, like, I'm going to just say 1% interest on your savings, but then it turns around and charges 5% interest on a mortgage. So that 4% in between is basically what they're collecting. Now, as the regional banks could no longer afford basically to give mortgages, they started to get sold. So I would go to my regional bank, I would apply for a mortgage, and they would help me through the process, but most often they were sold to two companies, either Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Now they were different than they are now, they were sort of privately owned. Now Fannie and Freddie would take these mortgages, they'd bundle them together and they'd create a security. Now this was great as long as the mortgages were low risk, because you see as an investor, I couldn't buy a single mortgage from somebody, but I could buy into a collection of mortgages. It was like a stock, you might say, almost like a mutual fund. And so it seemed like a pretty secure thing because people were going to pay on this for 30 years and I knew exactly what the interest rate was going to be. And so this was really good. But in the 1990, the subprime mortgage market goes mainstream. Basically, subprime mortgages are loans that they pose a high risk because the person who's getting the loan or the business that's getting the loan, they tend to have poor or flawed um, credit history. 
Now, this happens because in 1992, Congress passes these regulations that says Freddie and Fannie have to do more to help poor people get into houses because most people's wealth is in their house. And so they're sort of told, do something to help this. And one of these charts that you see over here, you can see the ratio of some pie mortgage rates just go up dramatically right here in 2003. And that's right after Congress has passed this, you know, basically legislation that says, you guys, you need to do something to lift people out of poverty. You're making it too hard to get a mortgage. But 1993, not only is Freddie and Mac doing this, but many established banks, large banks are starting to do this, and specialized lenders are starting to come into play, things like Countrywide, who can see huge profits that could be made from these loans because these particular loans had really high interest rates. And so I might go to the bank having good credit, and I may pay well, let's just say 3% on the, on the mortgage, where somebody who had bad credit, they might be paying 6, 7, 8% on the mortgage. And they were given all these funky types of mortgages, interest only, balloon payments. And so what happens is, is that these subprime mortgages are really being sold, but they're also being bundled into financial securities. And they're sort of being sold just like the ones that didn't have subprime mortgages in it. And unless you really dug into the actual mortgages that were in the security you were buying, I meant the individuals, a lot of people didn't know what type of mortgages were in there, or they would bundle some with good and some with bad. And so this became a problem. This easy access to mortgage also drove up the demand for houses. And when we see a demand go up, we know prices go up. So again, you see this nice little chart and you can see right here in 2000, this huge steep climb of housing prices. And that's because there was great demand. People suddenly could get a mortgage. And if I could get a mortgage, I wanted to build a house. Now, what also becomes a problem is that the small regional banks, they weren't really loaning out to individual people. They started loaning out to developers because developers wanted to buy huge plots of land, develop lots of houses. And so as the regional banks were sort of giving money to the developers, the problem is, is by the time they were doing that, we are already seeing problems. And as the developers fell down and couldn't afford to sell the houses because they just didn't have buyers or they couldn't get mortgages for their people, that also basically hurt the economy, especially on the regional end. But higher home prices already did something else interesting. Somebody who already owned a home was starting to be talked into taking home equity loans because now they had this inflated value of their home. So maybe they bought their house for, oh, let's say $100,000. But because housing prices were going up so much, their house, they could sell it for $350,000. So that's a $250,000 increase. And this was not that uncommon. So people would come and say, hey, why don't you take some of that money and, you know, go on a vacation or buy a new car. So people were taking these second mortgages, these equity loans on their houses. The problem is, is the house really wasn't that valuable. It was inflated because of the time period. So when the bubble sort of burst and house prices started coming down, these people actually now were sort of backwards on their, their loans. They had a property that was not as valuable as much as the debt that they had taken out individuals had become too leveraged. So as these new securities started having losses and people couldn't afford them, it basically began to default on the mortgages and the securities would start to become worthless. Well, this brings us basically to 2006, 2007, because we see these low home prices now falling. And you saw that in that chart, they just crashed. We also began to see the mortgage in industry completely collapse and the mortgage industry at that point had gotten very large. The Dow Jones in February 27, um, I mean, sorry, February 27, 2007, it drops by 416 points. Now this is huge. And we see subprime mortgage loan people just starting to declare bankruptcy, 25 of them by 2007. In 2007 in April, New Century Financial Corp files for bankruptcy. Now this is one of the largest subprime lenders in the United States at the time. Now this begins to spook people, but what really spooks people is Bear Stearns, who comes out basically, the same month and says, hey, you know, two of our really large hedge funds, 
we're so sorry, but we've lost sort of most of the investors' capital. Why? Because they had bought a lot of these securities, and the securities had lost capital because people were defaulting on their mortgages. They weren't paying them. They couldn't afford them. So the security, which should have had a pretty good rate of return, was having a lousy rate of return. And as we just talked about, when your asset prices go down, your capital goes down. So as the capital went down, they basically had useless assets. Also, by August of 2007, Jim Cramer, who's um, a big sort of star, you might want to say, but finance guy on CNBC, he has this huge rant on TV. It becomes very famous. And whether the rant was right or wrong, what it does do is it begins to spook more investors. And we call the retail investors, the everyday man who's investing. But it gets the attention of the nation. And this is going to be important because people start thinking about this. Now, Bear Stearns, who had this big problem in, in April of 2007, by March of 2008, Bear Stearns is sold. It is sold for $10 a share. Now, originally, it looked like it was going to be sold for $2 a share. But the big thing was is that a week before, him, a week before it was sold, that stock was going for $172 a share. And the basic problem with Bayer Stearns was liquidity problems. They, again, had too many bad loans on the books. They had more bad loans than they had capital, and they were too leveraged. So, again, they begin to go insolvent. Luckily, they get purchased. But this sort of leads to this oh horrible 19-day stretch in September of 2008. Fannie and Freddie, they're going to go insolvent. They don't have enough capital because they have so many of these bad subprime mortgages in their, in their system. So the government basically has to take them over. They become conservative ships of the government. Why? Because they're basically they own a good portion of the U.S. mortgages. So what are we going to do? Make all the people in the U.S. – well, maybe not all, but most of the people in the U.S. – um, country have a company that defaults on their mortgages. We can't do that. And then Lehman Brothers. Now, this is huge because Lehman Brothers has to file for bankruptcy. Nobody will buy Lehman Brothers. Now, they also are, you know, too much gambling, you might want to say, on mortgages. And they really push these mortgages, by the way. They were an investment bank. And one of the interesting things about investment banks at the time, they didn't have to follow the same rules as retail banks. So FDIC wasn't there. All this stuff wasn't there. Now, the expectation was, though, that, you know, the government would help out Lehman Brothers. Nobody would make Lehman Brothers actually falter. They're the fourth largest bank in the United States. Lehman Brothers won't go under. Well, Lehman Brothers went under, and basically the government decided that they shouldn't bail them out. But they did decide the next day they had to bail out AIG, which was the world's largest insurance agency. And basically the thought was that they were too big to fail. Because by now, this insurance, this recession is beginning to hit worldwide. It's not just the U.S. It's all around the world. And this is the world's largest insurance agency. Now, the bailout of AIG winds up actually being very profitable for the United States. We pay back more money than we lent them. But think about this. You now see Lehman Brothers go down. You see Franny and Freddie being taken over. You see AIG needing help. And then Washington Mutual, this $300 billion financial institution, basically fails. There's not enough capital. Again, not enough capital. It's too leveraged. But this one is a bank. It's not an investment bank. It's a bank. And the FDIC has to step in. And basically, because people were FDIC insured, they got their money back. But not everybody did because at that point, the FDIC amount of money was only $125,000. And so if I'd put in two hundred, dollars I lost $75,000. It is after this sort of bailout or this having to um, go in with the FDIC where they actually raise the FDIC amounts. And then we also see things like Wachovia is sold. Now, it doesn't go under, but it's sold. Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, they decide that they can't be independent investment banks anymore. And they decide to change to banking holding companies. They come underneath federal regulations. Basically, it's the end of this investment era. But all of this has really, really spooked investors. And by October, we see the worst week 
in history for the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It drops more than 20 percent, and that leads to 240,000 job losses. Now, at that point, that was the largest like job loss in a month. By the end of the year, we're going to have 10 percent unemployment in that particular sector. Now, this is different than the pandemic unemployment where we had to shut businesses down, but we figured the businesses will open right back up once we get the pandemic underhand. The question, though, back then was how are we going to get an economy started again when they're basically the houses are gone, the businesses are gone. And we're not talking about mom and pop shop. And I love mom and pop, but we're talking about things that you know, basically employed 25,000, 30,000, 100,000 people were closing. And it wasn't just here in the U.S., it was worldwide. So we couldn't say, well, we'll start making things and send it to China or we'll make things and send it to the EU. It was everywhere. And as that happened, people pulled their money out of the market. They pulled their money out of hedge funds. They started keeping the money. They didn't want to lend the money out because they were afraid to lend the money out to businesses because who knew what business was going to go under next. So you couldn't trust the big businesses and the little businesses couldn't get any money. There was this crisis as far as what they call the financial crunch. You couldn't borrow money because there was no money to borrow. In fact, it got so bad that the central banks of most of the major countries, the U.S., China, Canada, Sweden, Switzerland, Britain, the Economic Union, they all coordinated to reduce interest rates at the same time. I mean, the Great Recession of 2008 taught us a lot, but what I really want you to understand is that this didn't start in September 2008. This started back in 1980 by the changes from federal government policies. And as government policies and as monetary and physical policies are changed, they have long-term effects. This is why we say that people who are assigned to the Fed have 14-year terms. We don't want people to think on the short term because as we think on the short term, then we're not looking at long-term issues. You can even see with the housing crisis, even though it's 1993 where we see the subprime mortgages really start to take off, it takes about eight, nine years before we really see that full effect of what happens in the economy. So this is a really quick rundown of the Great Recession of 2008, one that at this point um, we've come out of. But hey, we're going to have other great recessions that come along. Luckily, it was not a depression. There were things that came along that kept us from going into a Great Depression. But we were right on the edge back then. This again is a rundown of the Great Recession of 2008. It's part of another lecture called The Monetary System. And if you need to watch it, just click on the link next to you. Otherwise, keep learning.